Good morning, Dog Nation. I'm Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Presented today by Meriwether and Tharp. We think we have a really good show for you on tap. Terrence Edwards is coming by today. Terrence told us last week he's going to see some Georgia practice. We're going to try to find out exactly what it was that Terrence saw last week. Inside information from Terrence. We're going to try to get that on the program here today. Also, very honest words from a Georgia player and Kirby Smart about that player this week. I'm going to talk today on the program about why that matters based on what's about to happen over the course of the next few weeks in college football. I think this is an important topic to get into. We will do that. Uh, I'll also give you a quick word of warning here that typically one of the things we enjoy doing is a R.S. Andrews cool down after the show. Today we'll do that live, as we always do. Much, much shorter today, I do have to confess. I've got some stuff that's going to require me to step away from work for a little while this afternoon, so that means a little shorter version of the cool down here coming up. But to begin the show today, we're going to get it going this way with some information out there right now about what Georgia's fate may be like in the upcoming NFL draft. I'm going to try to explain how the NFL draft perhaps foreshadows Georgia's chances of winning a national championship based on some recent data. I think you'll find this interesting. I'm going to do my best to lay it out for you in a way that everybody can understand. So we'll get ready to do that here coming up. We're glad to have you with us for it. It is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Meriwether and Tharp. And it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Meriwether and Tharp, your source for Georgia divorce. Find them online at the Atlanta Divorce Team.com. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. So I believe I've got the best job in the world. I love my job, love coming to work each and every day. I genuinely enjoy doing the show, and yet my job is no different than anybody else's in that sometimes I'm sort of reflecting back on it. Did I do a good job? Did I do what I could do? Uh, Did I do the best that I could possibly do? And I would say that in you thinking about those things and doing those things, there's always like one part of my job that I sort of find to be a little bit difficult. And if I ever go home feeling like, you know what, I don't know that I did the very best I could possibly do today. There's sort of one kind of category of content that always seems to sort of feel that way for me. If I ever feel that way, it's because of something along this line, which is when there's a lot of information that has to sort of be winnowed down to just sort of the one or two things that really matter. And and sometimes in some of the discussions we have, it's like big mountains worth of stats or all kinds of stuff here and there. And yet you feel like that there is something meaningful in some of that data, but sort of projecting it and presenting it so that it's like the one or two things that really matter, maybe not quite simplifying it as well as you could. If you ever feel like you step out of bounds in this job, I feel like it's probably something related to that. So That's kind of the backdrop for all of this, which is we're going to get into kind of a heavy topic in terms of names and numbers, but we're going to try to sort of whittle this down into like one or two important takeaways that I think every Georgia fan can have on their mind as we move ahead to the upcoming season. I want to start with this. There was a story at dognation.com, I believe it was yesterday, Mike Griffith, the author, looking at something that Matt Miller, the NFL draft scout, had done for ESPN.com. And Speaking of like sort of like ponderous activities, can you imagine doing a seven round mock draft? Uh, Can you imagine, you know, 32 teams, seven rounds worth of picks? You know, think about, you know, the the thousands of players that get drafted sort of in a situation like that. I mean, can you imagine going through, you know, all of that? But that's what Matt Miller did for ESPN.com. And in doing so, we come away with a little bit of an idea for what the upcoming NFL draft is going to look like for Georgia. Now, I don't want to like go too deep into all of this, but I just want to give you a little bit of a snapshot. You can read the full story for yourself there at dognation.com. So according to Miller from ESPN, as chronicled by Mike, you've got nine Georgia players projected to be drafted in this upcoming draft. Bowers, Mims, McConkey, first-round picks. Bullard, Laster, second-round pick. Tyke Smith in the fourth. Cedric Von Prahn in the fifth. And then Marcus Rosemey Jackson and Kendall Milton both slipping into the seventh round of the draft, according to Matt Miller, ESPN. Now, you may agree with that. You may disagree with that. You may think Miller's the wrongest guy on the Internet. But that is his projection right now. Nine Georgia Bulldogs to be drafted, three of those being taken in the first round. So let me tell you why I think this is interesting for Georgia 
and let me tell you and kind of build to what I think could be interesting about this for Georgia here in the upcoming season. Really, two things for me sort of stand out as it relates to all of this. First of all, we're seeing a little bit of a downward trend in the total number of players being drafted for Georgia. You want to go back and look a year ago, there were 10 total players being drafted by Georgia. And if you want to go back and look at the previous draft prior to that in 2022, which was the draft after Georgia broke through and won a national championship for the first time during the Kirby Smart era, you saw 15 players drafted. So in 2022, 15 dogs drafted. In 2023, 10 dogs drafted. And as projected by ESPN right now, there will be nine Georgia Bulldogs selected. Now, let me tell you quickly why I think that's interesting. There's the old adage in sports, which is you play for the name on the front of the jersey and not the back of the jersey. In other words, committing yourself to the team is more important than your own individual pursuits or individual ambitions. And I guess in a roundabout way, that's probably true. But one of the things I think is really cool in football is there seems to be a a real interesting unity between what you do to sort of play for yourself, your professional future, your ambitions of being in the NFL, and how that contributes to team success there as well. Because the one thing we've seen, we've chronicled this a lot over the years, there's a very strong correlation between teams that have a lot of NFL draft success and teams that win national championships. The old adage about playing for the name on the front or the name on the back, your team or yourself. In college football, you really have the opportunity to do both. That as you get better as a player individually and as your teammates do the same thing, you come together as a team that can be unstoppable the way that Georgia for the most part was in 2021 and 2022. So I find that to be interesting. And we would also, if we're being honest, even if we think that Georgia should have been included in the college football playoff, and I believe they should have this year, one way or another, Georgia came up just a little bit short of winning the national championship. Fairly or not, that is the factual result of the season. And so with that in mind, the notion that Georgia had just a little bit, or at least is projected to have a little bit less of a draft success this year compared to a year ago, and a good bit less success compared to what it had uh, the draft after the 2021 season, that sort of makes sense based on what we're seeing with our own eyes, right? You follow me so far that Georgia is projected to have fewer players drafted than it did in either of its national championship seasons. And perhaps that might make some sense, given the fact that this year, uh, fairly or not, Georgia came up just a little bit short of winning a national championship. So with all that said, I think the very important question to ask yourself is this. Well, if this year's Georgia team, the one that just took place in 2023, has a little bit less in the way of NFL draft capital on its roster, draft prospects on its roster, where's the hole? Where is the deficiency compared to the previous two years? And y'all, this is where I think things get really, really interesting. And this is where this topic, I believe, has a lot of relevance as you look ahead to 2024 and then the 2025 NFL draft. If Georgia is going to win a national championship this upcoming season, something I think all of us believe uh, they either will do or certainly can do, then this is the void that has to be filled. This is the hole that has to be accounted for in comparison to Georgia teams that did win the national championship. Let me walk you through this here just a little bit. When you look at what ESPN projects for this year's NFL draft uh, compared to previous years, you're talking about a pretty similar number of quarterbacks over the course of the, the three years. Georgia didn't have one draft in 2022. Obviously, Stetson drafted last year. No quarterback projected this year. Running backs also somewhat similar. You had two backs taken in 22. You're going to have one back taken in 2023. Projected to have one for this upcoming year there as well. I guess right now, Dejon Edwards not projected to be drafted. Georgia didn't have a receiver drafted last year. They're projected to have two this year. Only had one in 2022. Uh, Georgia's projected to have one tight end drafted this year. Same number of tight ends drafted the previous years. Offensive line, also similar numbers there as well defensive backs they had two drafted in 2022 they had two drafted in 2023 they're projected to have three here this year and sort of on and on you go in terms of positions on the offensive side of the ball defensive backs where 2022 2023 projected for this year you're seeing a similar number of players being drafted the place where it gets wildly different is on a certain aspect of the defense we're going to kind of broadly describe as the as the front seven 
That's where things get really, really different for Georgia. What they did have in the 2022 draft, what they did have in the 2023 draft, compared to what they're projected to have for the 2024 draft. Let's look at defensive line here for a moment. Georgia had three defensive linemen drafted in the first round of the 2022 NFL draft. Of course, all of them first rounders, as we said, but three total draft picks. Georgia had one defensive lineman a year ago, also a first round pick. This year, as you know, Georgia isn't projected to have any defensive lineman drafted at any point in time in this year's NFL draft. And when we look at Georgia on the field, doesn't that somewhat make sense? Don't our eyes back up what this data is telling us? that Georgia didn't quite have the same level of defensive line this year, gave up more rushing yards, weren't quite as dominant at the point of attack as they had been in the past. The NFL draft data, the projections for this year's draft, seemed to match what Georgia had going on on the field there. It's also sort of true when it comes to the outside linebacker spot. Georgia's not projected to have an outside linebacker in this year's draft, despite the fact they had two drafted a year ago. What's interesting is, in this national championship era for Georgia, when you've had 30 uh, game winning streak over the course of that span, Georgia's actually only had two outside linebackers drafted in the entirety of that time. So that's a position group of where things have probably actually kind of underperformed overall compared to the success of other positions. You look at inside linebackers. Georgia had three drafted in 2022, didn't have any drafted in last year's draft, not projected to have any drafted here this year. So what you see for Georgia, the 2024 draft, reflective of the 2023 season, a lot fewer players drafted in kind of that front seven than you certainly had after national championship seasons in 2022 and national championship seasons of 2023, especially along the defensive line, where that was the hallmark of what made the 2022 one team what it was and Jalen Carter obviously representing that for the 2022 team Georgia has got to get back to that if it wants to have national championship success for this upcoming season the NFL draft I think foreshadows everything you need to know about that now the one caveat to some of this is some of the Georgia players who chose to return for this upcoming season had they put their name in the NFL draft would have almost certainly been drafted and therefore that would have changed these numbers at least somewhat. But nonetheless, guys like Nazir Stackhouse and Warren Brinson did come back to Georgia for a reason because they didn't really feel like they were ready, apparently, for the NFL draft. They wanted to kind of give themselves a little bit more chance to show what they're all about as players. So it probably stands to reason that Kirby Smart was asked about this this week. He was talking about this week. Brinson and Stackhouse coming back the development of the other defensive linemen behind them, you know, while they're watching and and learning from Brenton and Stackhouse, also trying to develop themselves, and the idea that Georgia can get back to being on its front uh, seven, on its defensive line, what it was in 2021, what it was in 2022, if it wants to be back in the national championship business for 2024. Kirby Smart talked about that this week through the lens of Brenton and Stackhouse and their decision to return. This is what Kirby Smart had to say. Yeah, it's great as long as uh, uh, age doesn't prevent growth. I mean, there's opportunities for younger players to come in and grow and get better. And I think uh, those guys, we have to be smart about, number one, how we practice them, the reps they take, do they stunt growth. If they stunt growth, then maybe we don't get better for the next year. I certainly didn't sit on this podium last year this time thinking those two guys would be back. So the fact they were is a luxury uh, in terms of depth. But we still have to get better. And if they stay the same, they did no good coming back. And we've had multiple talks about how easy it is to get comfortable and complacent in these years. But they both have a purpose. So are they going to have a chip on their shoulder or are they just going to sit around and, 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 and just, you know, collect? I hope they get better. I hope they grow. I hope they have intentions of uh, moving up and improving their, their, their draft status and getting their degrees. Both of them are on track to do that. I think that's a very compelling statement from Kirby Smart. It's a simple question. To guys like Warren Brinson and uh, Nazir Stackhouse, how do you want to feel this time a year from now? Do you want to feel like you've done everything you could do to make yourself the best football player you can possibly be and be a part of a very successful NFL draft conversation, the likes of which perhaps took place for Jalen Carter or Devontae Wyatt or a Trayvon Walker or obviously a Jordan Davis? And conversations like that, as we're saying right now, or about more than just how rich Brinson and Stackhouse could be, or Jordan Hall could be, or Christian Miller could be, or any of those guys. This also benefits Georgia as a team there as well. 
there is an incredibly strong correlation. The teams that do better in the NFL draft also seem to be competing for championships. The teams that have high number of draft picks, a la Georgia in the 2022 draft or you know even in the 2023 draft, those are the teams that also seem to win national championships there as well. This year, Georgia, at least projected by ESPN, going to come up a little bit short in there in that regard. Perhaps it's also then understandable that Georgia came up just a little bit short in winning the national championship this season there as well. To correct that for 2024, you've got to replenish the areas where you've been great in the past. For Georgia, that's on the front seven. That's the defensive line in particular. And if Georgia's back in business for next year's NFL draft at those positions, then it's also probably in business to win another national championship as well. My name's Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Mary Weather and Tharp. We're happy to have you with us, no matter how you get to us today. Whether it's on video, we're live everywhere at 10 a.m., or even earlier than that at dognation.com and on the Dog Nation app at 945. We call that our first in 15. From the radio, Athens Sports Radio 960. The ref are available as a podcast wherever you find them, including the world-famous dognation.com. Posting that show every day, getting it up there, for our loyal podcast audience, we certainly appreciate that. Speaking of loyalty, longtime friends of ours, Meriwether and Tharp, make the show possible for you here today. And I love the fact they've been with us for a long time because I truly believe that Meriwether and Tharp can serve you in what you might find one of the most challenging situations you ever face. That's the divorce process. And of course, you know how I feel about this. If you can save your marriage, you probably should. But many of you have been trying, and you've been trying for a while, and you just sort of find that it's just a sort of an irreconcilable situation, that it's an unavoidable outcome for you. And that's the situation you find yourself in. That's why I want you to know, know about my friends at Meriwether and Tharp. And I want you to understand the creative links they go to to make this process as easy for you as it possibly can be. One of the areas, and this is one of the things I cite frequently, is the way in which they're going to help you pay for all of this there as well. Because one of the big questions that people often have, and this is knowledge our friends at Meriwether and Tharp have gained from listening to people like you talk over the course of years, they want to know what this process is going to cost them. They want some sort of cost certainty about going through all of this. And so working and thinking and planning, Meriwether and Tharp has come up with sort of a menu of options to help you pay for this and give you some choices about how you choose to pay for this and and get that cost certainty perhaps that you really want when it comes to uh, this divorce situation. So if you feel like your situation is not very complicated and it's perhaps pretty straightforward, then you might want to take advantage of what they kind of, kind of call like a DIY option where you're handling a lot of this yourself and it's just 99 bucks, uh, you know, starting as low as that anyway, uh, super simple and super straightforward. Or if you want something that's a little bit more traditional, kind of full service, full representation, well, that's what Meriwether and Tharp can provide for you there too. But there's also other options there as well, and this may be like the most popular thing they're offering right now. They call it their model M&T, which is uh, a payment plan. You can either do like a monthly subscription that you would pay while your divorce process is ongoing. If you'd rather pay it as a flat fee, you can get the cost certainty of doing it that way there as well. Just really creative stuff they're doing to help the divorce process be as streamlined for you as it can be. Some of the emotional weight, you know, you can always take that away. But the process of getting to a satisfactory outcome as quickly as possible but well, that's what our friends at Meriwether and Tharp can certainly help you with. So please find them online, georgiadivorceteam.com. That's the website, georgiadivorceteam.com, for more on that. Of course, it's great to have our friends at Meriwether and Tharp and all of you with us here today on Dog Nation Daily. Also going to be really fun to have Terrence Edwards here coming up in just a moment. Prior to that, though, I do want to go around the doghouse, and I want to focus in on one player in particular here for a moment for a couple of reasons. Reason number one because this is a player that I believe has a chance to be incredibly important for George here this year. But also reason number two, this is a player whose story perhaps foreshadows something that's about to be really important in college football overall, and maybe even here at UGA there as well. The player that I'm talking about is cornerback Julian Humphrey, who chose to stay at Georgia and compete for the cornerback spot here this year. And everything we've heard thus far during spring is that Humphrey, who we believe could have a very bright future at UGA going back to a year ago, 2024 could have been his year. Everything we're hearing so far seems to suggest that Humphrey is taking advantage of that opportunity. In fact, this week when Kirby Smart met with reporters, he talked exactly about what Julian Humphrey is showing as a football player here right now. And if you're a Georgia fan that wants the best, this defensive secondary, a positive update like this on Julian Humphrey is certainly going to be something you're going to enjoy. This is what Kirby said about Humphrey here this week. 
if everybody understands Kamari's situation last year, Kamari could only practice, uh, I would say, 30, 40 percent of the practices uh, during the season. So there was uh, a lot of available reps for uh, Julio. For Julio. He, he did a great job. Uh, he, uh, he worked hard. He picked things up. He had to increase his toughness. He's always been able to run. He's always been able to cover. But his issues came from knowing exactly what to do with people motion, things change. And I thought last year he did a great job of that. He picked all that up. He played really big in our Missouri game um, and, and covered people well. Had just kind of a breakout game there. And then he had the unfortunate injury against Ole Miss. So uh, he's had uh, a good spring practice so far. I hope that continues. He's hungry. Uh, we got good competition going on at corner. You know, we don't we don't look at it as two corners. I mean, we look at it as if there's four corners that can play, one of them's going to also play star, and uh, they'll all play. So I love that from Kirby Smart. I also like the fact that Julian Humphrey told us this week why people call him Julio, the fact that he's like Julio Jones, and that's where the nickname came from. I was actually happy to learn that. I was sort of afraid I was the only one that didn't know why everybody calls him Julio all the time. But uh, Humphrey was good enough to kind of explain that to us here this week. And Kirby Smart was also good enough to go into more detail about the fact that, as I said before, all of the good stuff that's seemingly happening for Humphrey here right now could have perhaps not have occurred had Julian made the decision to transfer the way that some people at one point in time thought he might do. Humphrey eventually thought better of that. And Kirby this week kind of talked about that process of trying to convince Humphrey not to do that and the thought process that uh, Julio was going through as uh, he decided to ultimately stay at Georgia. Here's more from Kirby Smart on that topic. I think kids get confused. I think kids, a lot of times, um, we try to communicate really well with our kids, be upfront with our kids. But look, it's the nature of the beast. They turn on their phone and they see other people doing it. It becomes a trend. It's like a, anything else in social media. If he's doing it, then should I be doing it? In the grass greener on the other side, and sometimes they don't know. You know, sometimes they're getting reached out to by other places, and uh, maybe they shouldn't be. But that's just the nature of the beast. And uh, ultimately, he's here. That's the only thing I'm concerned with. And, I don't think that's a story that he was thinking of going in and going back. That's just the day and age we live in. The, the, the most important thing is he chose to be here and compete, and he's got a great family. Um, they've sacrificed a lot for Julio to be in the position he's in, and uh, they support their son. And they want him here because they know how we coach. And, and the thing I like about Julio's parents, they, 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 they appreciate the toughness that we coach him with. A very matter-of-fact assessment from the situation there from Kirby Smart, and it certainly sounds like there were some heartfelt discussions ongoing on the Georgia coaching side to say, you know, we got big plans for you. We think you can be a great player here. And it sounds like uh, Humphrey eventually really believed that to be true and believed the message that the Georgia coaches were trying to send him. Uh, Humphrey himself also talked about the story from his perspective this week about why he was considering making this move in the first place and ultimately why he chose not to. This is what Julian Humphrey said about this topic himself here this week. For the transfer portal, so like, you know, um, I'm, I'm from Houston, Texas, so like that's like 12 hours away when you drive and like, you know, after the games, I see like, you know, all my other teammates who like from Georgia, them with them, like them with their people and all that, like, you know, like kind of got to me a little bit. So like, that's why I'm in the portal because like, you know, I want to play close to my people, but then like, I talked to Kirby and Muschamp and um, or Dante, and then like, they were saying like, you know, this can be like a big year for me, you know, this can be like my like year, like come out, out like, to have a, a good year so like I thought about it and like you know it would just all be developed then just be down there just one year and just say that I'm close to my family but I just took it out here for like the development part is like more of a con compared to all on the school so yeah let me tell you why I think this story matters at the end of that clip there Humphrey says I talked to the coaches I was feeling homesick and have you ever felt homesick before like at any point in time in your life I certainly have Anytime there's an emotional pull back somewhere else, whether it's being homesick or just, you know, feeling like something's not quite right, like it, it's easy to tell yourself a bad story in a situation like that, right? And in the case of Humphrey, he was feeling homesick and yet talking to the Georgia coaches, they said, listen, we think this 2024 can be your year. The unspoken part about all this is, is that when the Georgia coaches told him that, those coaches had enough credibility to be believed. In other words, when Humphrey heard this from the Georgia coaches, he had a level of trust in those coaches to assume that they're telling me the real here and they're not just telling me what I want to hear. That the Georgia coaches apparently had told the truth enough in the past 
to have it be assumed that they're also telling the truth right now. And y'all, this is going to be really, really important when it comes to what's coming next in college football in some form or fashion. There's a lot of like really fatalistic language out there right now. In fact, let me show you this on the screen. Uh, some of y'all know who Josh Pate is, the guy who works 24-7 sports. Uh, we referenced this briefly the other day, uh, Pate talking about that he's heard rumblings of utter chaos awaiting in the post-spring transfer portal. And he's kind of put that out there a couple of times. He's not the only one, too. And, you know, sometimes this I know something you don't know stuff ends up being a lot of hot air. But to a certain degree, we can expect at least some chaos in the upcoming transfer portal. Uh, you know, some craziness, and much like Caden Proctor goes to Iowa, comes back to Alabama, probably some big names perhaps involved in all of that. And there is a degree to which that you can't fully play defense in against all of that. But you can do some things as a program to protect yourself. You can do some things to keep guys like Julian Humphrey and Daniel Harris and other would-be transfers. You can do some things to keep guys like that in your program. And I believe the words from Humphrey give you an idea exactly what you should do. Just tell the truth. Be honest. Have a long-standing credibility that the words I use are true as a coach, that I'm here to do right by you and tell you the truth. And so if I tell you, listen, you stay here, we think you can do some big things, then when you say that, players likely believe it. There are a lot of coaches that lose a lot of players in the transfer portal because the players just don't trust them. And so as Georgia continues to earn trust and develop trust with its players, then perhaps the chaos that's going to exist in the upcoming spring transfer portal, if it is indeed true, Georgia doesn't have to be a participant in that as long as it keeps treating players the way that it seems to be treating guys like Julian Humphrey. An important word there, and an important thing to keep in mind, as Humphrey is very, very honest about almost leaving Georgia and why it was that he decided to stay. And that is around the doghouse here today on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Mary Weather and Tharp. Now, last week we had a very interesting conversation with Terrence Edwards, the former Georgia wide receiver in the program, Terrence telling us he's going to get a chance to see some Georgia football practice. What did Terrence see? We're going to see if we can find out now as we welcome him on to Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Tharp here today. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. So always great to have Terrence Edwards as a part of the program. And uh, as we said, we'll get into some of the stuff going on at Georgia practice here coming up in uh, just a few minutes. Terrence, if you don't mind, though, prior to that, all these uh, dire predictions out there right now, that the spring transfer portal is about to be crazy. It's about to be wild. It's about to be chaotic, I believe, the word that's used. Georgia seemingly has done a pretty good job of navigating some of that. Guys like Julian Humphrey that could have left, they didn't. Guys like Daniel Harris that could have left, they didn't. It seems like those players, for the most part, kind of believing the message that Georgia is uh, sending to them. I guess as a coach yourself and as someone who interacts with a lot of players, how chaotic do you think the two-week period sort of post-G-Day, post-spring games, how chaotic do you think that version of the transfer portal has the chance to be right now? I think it can be very chaotic for certain teams. I don't think there will be a lot of movement through the Georgia program because of the stability at the top with Coach Smart and the rest of the coaching staff. So I don't think there will be a lot of movement Will they be some? Maybe so, but I think the top guys that is going to be contributors next year, I think they're going to stay. Um, man, that, so I don't see Georgia losing any important key players, but this is college football, and it's, it's the unthinkable. So whatever you believe to be true, <laughs> we yeah. just have to wait and see. How about the other point that I was making there a moment ago that Humphrey was thinking about leaving. Georgia said, listen, if you stay, we think this could be your year. Terrence, as you know, there are a lot of coaches that are full of hot air, and they say one thing and they do something else. I mean, in fact, we studied this with the Alabama situation where allegedly, you know, Ryan Grubb was only hanging around to let that portal clock expire on Nick Saban's retirement. Then after that, he bolts right to the uh, Seattle Seahawks with a job that apparently he always wanted to take and perhaps always knew he was going to take. There are a lot of coaches who apparently tell players some things that are not true. How important is it at a place like Georgia where it seems like there is just a little bit more uh, credibility perhaps among the coaches that if if they look at a guy like Humphrey and say, we think this can be your year, apparently the coaches have enough credibility in the mind of the player to be believed in a situation like that. How much does that help you as a program avoid the potential portal chaos that might be awaiting other teams? Yes, I tell the kids all the time that come through my program or who help, who I help that all these coaches are used car salesmen. They're going to 
tell you what you want to hear throughout the recruiting process, but their actions speak louder than words. And I think Georgia's actions spoke louder than words for Julio. Uh, he did get opportunity to play last year, and I can remember vividly in the Missouri game when uh, for the first time, I think in the Kirby era, that we had a cornerback following a certain receiver, and Lasseter had the task to follow uh, Missouri's top receiver, so that brought Julio in, and so he saw the opportunity there that he was the next man up in the cornerback rotation, and uh, inevitably he's the next guy up because uh, last year is going to the NFL, so he yeah. know he has the opportunity to be the next guy up, and um, you know I, I saw the opportunity there when I was there, um, him and Daniel Harris, and um, Everett was really the top three guys, but I know we're going to get into this later, but. I saw an article on Doll Nation. Uh, KJ and and the other cornerback. Uh, Ellis Robinson. Slipped my mind. Ellis Robinson. Uh, El, Ellis Robinson. Yes, they are the real deal. Ooh, <laughs> I like to hear that. So let's go ahead and get into the spring practice stuff here a little bit. You told us last week you're going to be there for the coaching clinic. It's one of the great things I think that Georgia does. I think coaches genuinely enjoy that, but it's also a chance to see some Georgia practice there as well. And your ability to watch this is so much different than the average person's is because you've been through Georgia practices yourself. I just think you have a better you know, insight into what it is that you're seeing. So some kind words there for K.J. Bolden and Ellis Robinson, which we really enjoy. Uh, I guess let me start with that, and then we'll kind of broaden this out. Expand a little bit on what you saw from K.J. and Ellis first and foremost here. So I've known K.J. since he was a little kid. He's done some training with me when he thought he was a receiver. Uh, so he's I've known him forever. And the one thing that you can see from KJ is his confidence that he belongs, even if he's not doing it exactly right. Or he may have a missed assignment because he's still learning and adjusting to the college game. But his confidence level that he belongs, that's the part that you have to get over a lot of these kids that the confidence level and football is all about believing in yourself. And KJ believes in his ability. Is he doing everything right yet? Probably not, but his confidence, it just bleeds over uh, onto the field of play, and that's half the battle. So um, that's going to get him on the field earlier. And if any other coaches were there to see this interception that Robson had, this diving interception, where I think Ryan just threw the ball up, he just made this diving interception that was just unbelievable. Champ Bailey-ish type play. So I, I love the, the young secondary, even uh, – Omar Evans, I think his name is, and DeMello, like the secondary that we will have in the next year or so, it's probably could be potentially just off talent. We know it, it goes a little bit deeper than talent, but just talent alone, this could be one of the top groups that we've ever had with KJ and Omar and uh, that group. It's, it, it's something special to watch. Yeah, so and it was Ellis Robinson that had the interception that you were describing there, and it's obviously Andre yes. Evans, as you were mentioning, the, the, the defense Andre back to discuss. Evans, yes. Yeah. But it was Ellis Robinson that had the uh, interception that you uh, saw there? Yes, it, it was a diving catch, and it, it was an amazing play. It, it was an amazing play. And any coaches was there that saw that, they can contest to that that one play, and it stood out to me. Boy, that sounds great. How about other things that you observed while you were out there on the practice field, Terrence? Uh, Dominique Lovett is, is the guy that I think could be receiver one. He he made every play out there. Uh some of the young guys, like Anthony Evans, is going to be another guy that's his speed from that slot position. I saw him a lot in the slot. That speed that he has uh, is going to translate to Saturdays, being able to have third and fourth corners trying to cover him. Uh, Kobe Taylor, the, the, the receiver. Yeah, from, Kobe Young, yeah. Kobe, uh, Young, Kobe yeah. Young, I'm sorry. Kobe Young from Miami is a big, big dude. Man, he's a big dude. So I got an opportunity to watch him. So. I, and I can tell you this right here. Probably the most impressive thing that I saw was the confidence from Carson Beck. Um, I saw him last year at this time, and where he was trying to, you know, become the leader. We knew it's his job, but he really still had to go out there and win the job. This year, he knows he's the man, and you could tell from his confidence and being the leader of this team. Is that what you want from your corner, corner your quarterback? that he just knows it's, it's his team and it, he's the guy. He's going to lead us to where we want to go. And you can tell that you can see it on the practice field. And let me tell you what I like about that, Terrence. You know, Carson himself has been pretty honest about that. You know, when you're really confident, 
you're able just to be honest. You don't need to feel the need to sort of put on any kind of like false front or false airs. Like, I mean, Carson will tell you that that he does feel more assured right now because he does know he's the starting quarterback. And it sounds like what you're seeing from him is the sort of aura that you want uh, a starting quarterback to have. You know, this is a little bit different kind of thing for Georgia this year where, you know, Stetson was a Heisman finalist, became a second round pick, but the projections for Beck perhaps have him even higher than that. And, I would say that if you are going to be that kind of quarterback, it ought to be noticeable at practice. And from your standpoint, it sounds like that it was. Yes, most definitely. He 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 is the guy. He is. You know, last year he was still in competition with with Van de Griff, and he didn't know. He wasn't as sure of himself. He's bit very sure of himself right now that he's the guy. He's the leader of the team, and he's the guy that is going to take this team to. Uh, possibly to play off and hopefully another national championship opportunity. His confidence, his aura, everything exudes that out there on that field. And and I love seeing him and just some of the balls that he was confident and able to throw. You didn't see that last year with the confidence. It was hope. Now that he knows what he's doing 100% and he knows he is the guy. And when you know that you're the guy, it's just totally different when you're competing for the job. So let me talk about a couple of these receivers that you mentioned. You talk about Dominic Love, what you're seeing from him in the slot position. How much, and Ra Ra Thomas would be in this category too, how much do they benefit from the fact they've now been here a year? If we're going to say in the case of Carson Beck, well, now he knows he's the starter. That's a year later. He's got all that extra seasoning that comes from that. In the case of Love, it, you know, being a part of a different offense, in the case of Ra Ra being a part of an offense that's very different from the Mike Leach style system that he was a part of there at Mississippi State, like, how much more comfortable does a guy like Lovett, who you say that you're impressed by, how much more comfortable does he look playing in a uh, system now that he's just been in for a year? Right, just totally different, especially uh, Rara. Both of those guys just look totally different from last year. I can remember last year um, watching spring practice, Rara and Dominique Lovett was on the opposite field with Coach Mac a lot, just learning what to do. And now they are not on that field anymore. They're down there with the ones getting all the reps because they know what to expect. They know how to practice. It's just know the Georgia way. Uh, so you just can see that in those guys, and you just can see their talent. Um, so if, if Ra Ra stays healthy, Dominique stays healthy, I just think those two guys are going to be the leaders of that group statistically. But then you still got Dylan Bell, who's just a – just a monster of a football player. And I use football player Mm -hmm. in the same sense of we use football players with Heinz Ward, just do it all, do it everything. And you just have to find ways to get him the football uh, because he's just that special of a talent. Uh, The running back room is so deep, so I don't know if they're going to put him in the backfield anymore, uh, but we just have to find ways to get him him the football. We just, you know, all those targets that brought, had last year is definitely going to go to the receiving core. And, uh, you know, Oscar, Oscar looked great. Just the, the whole yeah. offense just looked more confident on a, a Mike Bobo and going into his second year as the offensive coordinator. Boy, Georgia fans love to hear that, myself included. Let me deal with a couple of other names that you mentioned. In the case of Anthony Evans, you know, what you're saying echoes a lot of the whispers that are out there there as well. Is it speed? Is that the thing that's kind of standing out about Evans right now, his ability to run away from people? Is that what's causing him – to get noticed in a situation like this? Yes, it's, it's hard to cover someone who has that type of speed in the slot. Um, so his speed that he's going to be able to display coming from that slot position is probably going to be probably the fastest slot receiver that we've ever had at Georgia that, that played the slot. Um, he brings a different dimension. Uh, I just think straight line, fast, he's, he's faster than Lad. Lad may have a little bit more wiggle. Than, than Evan, but just straight line speed. Um, Anthony's going to be able to just take the top off defenses. So I'm looking for him to really have a good year. And I've been preaching, you know, this for years now. Um, I think Aaron Smith lost some confidence last mm-hmm. year. And you can see that he, he definitely gained that confidence back by some of the contested catches that he made at practice. So he needs to bring that now to to the fall when, when it's time to display on Saturdays in front of millions of people I'm ready to see him just put it together. Yeah. Um, just that group as a whole is going to be very dangerous. And then lastly, uh, Colby Young's a guy we also talked about last week, and you said, you know, going into it last week, you're really just curious to see what he looked like. And the first thing you mentioned there is the size. That's what we keep hearing, whether it's 
you know, the Miami listing him at what, 6'5? Georgia, I think, list him at 6'3. I've heard some reporters call him 6'4. I don't know if that's just splitting the difference or what, but but clearly this is a bigger dude. Like what, you know, you know, stood out to you about Colby Young? Is it ability to high point the football because of how, you know, tall he supposedly is? What else about Colby Young did you find uh, interesting getting a chance to see him? Yes, I think I would bet my last dime that he's taller than 6'3. Okay. Uh, but he, he is 215 ish. And just the way he moves for a bigger receiver um, is very well. And he's his his ability to catch balls that's not the greatest thrown balls because his, his catch rate is, is another dimension that he's going to bring. And red zone presence is another dimension he's going to bring. And just being able to just throw the football up comfortably from the quarterback position, knowing that it's either going to be caught incomplete um, and then not in itself if the quarterback gives him an opportunity to, to hop on the football. And that's very satisfying for our offensive staff, knowing that if we just throw it high enough, it's either going to be incomplete or he's going to catch it and it's not going to be put in harm's way. Mm. Um, so I'm just ready to see him being able to just move the chains. Uh, like Lawrence Cager brought that yeah. dimension when he came from Miami. I could see him feeling in the same way Lawrence Cager did as well. How uh, healthy do you look? Because the weird thing is, you know, listen, and, and Terrence, I'm a, you know, obsessed with all these rumors the same way everybody else is. You hear about him doing this, you hear about him doing that, you know, good scrimmage performances, but you also hear, and some of our own, you know, Dog Nation colleagues have seen him appear at times a little hobbled from an ankle injury that we, I, I guess, know that he's dealing with here. So it's kind of weird to kind of reconcile, okay, well, on the one hand, he's got an ankle injury. On the other hand, you know, in these sort of 11-on-11 scrimmages, he's apparently doing really well, too. Did you see any limitations on an ankle, you know, for uh, for Colby Young at all? I didn't. I didn't see any limping. I didn't see any limitation. I didn't see any inability to go up and get the football. Um, so I didn't see that at all. I didn't see him getting out any reps. I didn't see him with the trainers. I didn't see any of that. So – uh, if he has something going on, he's tough enough and to fight through it to finish practice. And that's what you like to see, even if he's dealing something, he didn't take himself out of practice. Yeah. Last thing, and we'll let you go, Terrence. Your information is always really valuable. I think a lot of people are curious about quarterback beyond Carson Beck. You mentioned Ryan Puglisi throwing the interception. Ellis Robinson, probably not the only quarterback to uh, suffer that fate with Ellis, obviously. But how about more from Puglisi or, or, or Gunnar Stockton, who's trying to work the same route? that uh, eventually Carson Beck traveled to become the Georgia starting quarterback. Anything stand out about either Gunner or Puglisi in your chance to watch them? Yeah, especially Gunner. I think he's entrenched in being the backup, and I think his development is right on par. Uh, I would be very confident. I'm a knock on wood that um, if anything ever happened to Carson, that uh, Gunner can step in and the offense won't lose a beat. Uh, I think Carson is the best, better for passer out of the two, but gonna bring a dimension that Carson don't have. That's his ability to, to move the chains consistently with his, with his feet. Um, and, you know, Gunner's is going to play the style of, of football that he's always played at Raven County is playing it like a linebacker. Um, so he's not afraid to take on any defender in the open field and just his confidence as well that, you know, he is the next guy up. Um, that was very exciting to see. Uh, so I'm I'm very excited to see Garner and in, in any kind of time that he gets to uh, opportunity to get, and I'm ready to see him perform at, at G-Day. Boy, that's great to hear, Terrence. It gets us all excited about G-Day, I would say. And obviously we appreciate you on all of this, but also we appreciate the work that you're out there doing that next generation of pass catcher, your players there at Mount Vernon, where you're the uh, coach for, you got a lot going on here right now. In addition to observing things as it relates to Georgia football. So for people who want to be a part of the Terrence Edwards wide receiver Academy and get some of the training that you've been famous for, for such a long time, how can they get in touch and how can they be a part of all of that? Yes. Um, you can reach me on all social media platforms at Terrence Elwood's Wide Receiver Academy. Terrence, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Hope you and your family have a happy Easter. And by the way, can we also, speaking of your family, can we just clear this up? That you're not old enough to have a son uh, playing a basketball in the NCAA <laughs> tournament. I forget who that is. It was Terrence Edwards no. Jr. Can we just clear that up? That's not your son, right? That that is not my son. I've known this young man. Don't know him personally, but people have been asking me about this young man for a while because he's from the state of Georgia. I think he went to Tucker High School. Yeah. Uh, so Terrence that was junior that plays for James Madison that just got into the transfer portal. And I would love to see uh, Coach White from the basketball program take a shot at him 
uh, if he doesn't declare for the, the, in the, the NBA. But he is not my son. I do have a son that named Terrence Edwards the second, okay. who is 14. Uh, but it is not Terrence Edwards Jr. that plays with Jane Madison. And I'm going to say this today since we're on. Today is my 15th uh, year wedding anniversary. Oh, so, awesome. Uh, so it's been 15 years. So, no, I do not have a son. That name Terrence Edwards Jr. I do have one that's Terrence Edwards the second though. Oh, who's a great athlete? Fourteen. Yeah, a great athlete in his own right there for sure. So, a couple of things here. First of all, uh, happy anniversary to you and uh, your lovely bride. That is an amazing thing. And in addition to that, while Terrence Edwards Jr. from James Madison is not your son, you were a hooper back in the day. People need to be aware of that. That that you were a uh, that you were a uh, hooper back in the day. So I tell people this all the time. My first love is basketball. And I, if you remember, I did play very briefly on mm-hmm. the men's basketball team. I played football because I was good at it. I love basketball yeah. still to this day. Yeah, so people need to keep that in mind, that you know your way around the uh, hardwood <laughs> a little bit there as well. Uh, there you go. Good shot there of uh, Terrence and the uh, family and a wonderful thing there. 15 years of uh, marriage here right now. What a, a beautiful family that is. And uh, happy anniversary to you and uh, Mrs. Edwards, indeed. And uh, Terrence, hope you all have a uh, very happy Easter. And we'll look forward to uh, having you back here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Tharp again very soon as well. Thank you. Good stuff. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Yeah, so what we're talking about there is uh, James Madison had a basketball player named Terrence Edwards Jr. And people were reaching out said, Terrence's son. <laughs> uh, Terrence has got uh, great sons, great athletes. Uh, as a part of his uh, family there, but Terrence Edwards Jr. is not uh, one of those. So uh, really, really uh, fun and interesting stuff. With that said, let's get ready to go cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. And man, oh man, does Royal Caribbean have some great stuff in store for you in 2024. By now, you know, we've got our Dog Nation cruise coming up, and you can't be a part of that, right? It's like at this point in time, literally, figuratively for now, soon to be literally, that ship has sailed. But you can be a part of the great things that Royal Caribbean's got in store for you in 2024. How about this when you see Perfect Day Coco Cay right there and the thrill side of the island, the water park there. You get the tallest water slide in North America at Perfect Day Coco Cay. It's only accessible via the Royal Caribbean cruise ship. It's a private island for those exclusively on a Royal Caribbean cruise vacation. But uh, the water park there is amazing. It's the Thrill Water Park as a part of Perfect Day Coke. Okay, watch this. Go up the top there on the uh, on the uh, raft and come back down. For those of you who are uh, watching on video anyway, it's a part of the fun stuff that's in store for you when you choose a Royal Caribbean cruise ship here for 2024. And so many of those Royal Caribbean cruise vacations do go to Perfect Day Coke. Okay. In fact, when I'm you know kind of doing my search for which you know ship I want to go on, which port. I want to sail out of. I'm always looking for those itineraries that include Perfect Day Coco K. There was some dis- debate and discussion this year. Perhaps we'd pursue a little bit of a different itinerary for our Dog Nation cruise. Maybe we might go somewhere else other than Perfect Day Coco K. I'm telling you right now, I want my cruise vacations at Royal, Royal Caribbean there at Perfect Day Coco K because I believe it sets Royal Caribbean apart from any other player in this space. There is nothing like a day, truly a perfect day at Perfect Day Coco K. And Jessica Slater can tell you more about that. Give her a call, 770-718-9147. That's 770-718-9147. You can also email her, jslater at dreamvacations.com. She can tell you more about all of that. All right. As we're cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean here today, there's an interesting piece from Brad Crawford up at 247sports.com where, and we say this all the time, we like lists. I think stuff like that's fun. Anything that creates debate for college football is always the kind of thing that we enjoy because we're in the college football debate business. And uh, Brad at 24-7 Sports has got his list out of the toughest environments for 2024 in college football. And perhaps not a surprise that uh, Tiger Stadium, Death Valley for LSU came in number one on the list. They're typically sort of thought to be a tough and raucous environment. In fact, LSU home games this year could be pretty interesting. We've said if you really look a little bit deeper at the LSU schedule, one of the things that you see is that compared to some of the SEC teams, they get themselves a little bit of a break. There's also a weird scheduling anomaly. At some point in time, we may talk more about this. LSU is playing both UCLA and USC this year, which is kind of strange. But nonetheless, LSU got the uh, nod for the toughest environment, according to Brad Crawford. But guess who came in at number two? That is Sanford Stadium and UGA. Now, 
I think this is the culmination of an incredible success story for Georgia because whether fair or not, I think Sanford Stadium between the hedges, Georgia had the reputation for a while of not exactly being the most raucous environment. We did all this with, uh, what's his name, the former Tennessee quarterback prior to the game against Tennessee in 2022. Other sort of people have kind of weighed in on topics similar to this, that somehow Georgia was just deficient from an environment standpoint. Beautiful venue, great tailgating, but fans perhaps not the most passionate, at least in terms of how they're yelling and screaming during the game. We would say that, you know, that was probably a little bit of an overstated thing to begin with, that Georgia probably in the 21st century has had more good environments than sometimes it was given credit for. But there's obviously been an incredible change in that in recent years. The success that Kirby Smart has had at Georgia brings some of that. But also, I just think that fans are becoming more aware that they're being judged. You know, the same way that the team is being judged, being evaluated. I think fans realize that. Georgia students want to think they're at school during a special era. And so, therefore, they work really hard to create these great in-stadium atmospheres because There are lists like this that come out. There are rankings that come out, and fan behavior gets judged the same way that player performance gets judged. And so now you get a situation in which, you know, Sanford Stadium and University of Georgia is being recognized as this great, incredible, you know, venue for all of this. And as I said before, uh, it sort of gives you an idea of how much this reputation has grown over time, something I think that's really fun to consider. And the proof is in the pudding here. Uh... The thing that proves how raucous of an environment Sanford Stadium in Georgia really is, is the fact they don't lose there. They haven't lost a home game of any stripe since 2019. That that home losses for Georgia have just been few and far uh, between. Uh, Undefeated in 20, undefeated in 21, undefeated in 2022, undefeated last year there as well. Georgia just doesn't lose home games. And so if you want to know how tough the environment is, that's everything that you need to know. A story that's gotten some attention, I want to spend a minute or two on this. This doesn't impact the entirety of our audience, but some of you are interested in this. So the NCAA and Charlie Baker, the new NCAA president, is making a big push to ban a certain kind of wagering on college sports. What Baker wants to do away with is what you call player props. This is a little bit like if you ever played like daily fantasy sports, uh, player props kind of function a little bit like that where – Let's say it's Carson Beck passing yards, for instance. You set the number at 243, let's just say, which, you know, uh, you know, do you want to go over that or under that? You can place a wager uh, on more or less than a number like that, not just for passing yards. It can be rushing yards. It can be touchdowns. There's all kinds of player props that exist in professional sports. There was recently a controversy in the NBA about some uh, chicanery involving one player's, you know, individual prop bets. Uh, but in college sports, uh, you know, you've had the opportunity in some cases to do this. But Charlie Baker wants this ban. There's been a lot of concern about, you know, there was the Temple basketball thing uh, recently. There's been the Iowa, Iowa State stuff, the Alabama baseball stuff. There's been some weird encroachments into this college sports world between some gambling controversy, at least allegedly speaking. And so perhaps in response to that, Baker wants to eliminate these prop bets, these these individual player props. Here's the thing, though, that perhaps not everybody's aware of. A good number of the major sports books don't take college player props anyway. These are already banned in, I want to say, about half the states. Some of y'all know better than I do. uh, But about half the states already ban player props. And here's what I have a sneaking suspicion of. I think if the major players in the space, FanDuel, DraftKings, Caesars, you know, uh, Hard Rock to a certain extent, you know, uh, Bet Rivers, you know, I think the major sports books that are out there, the major sort of digital players in the space. I think if they had their way, they would ban all of this. And I think for the most part, what you see with the NCAA is when the NCAA bans something, it's usually because someone doesn't want it. In other words, why are there dead periods when it comes to recruiting? Because secretly that's what the coaches want. They want a break from recruiting. And so therefore, oh, it's a dead period. I can't be out during this dead period. Like most of the NCAA rules, the things that are outright banned are banned because coaches or administrators somewhere just don't want to do it, and so therefore they were able to get it banned so they don't have to do it. I think you see a similar situation playing out here right now. Like, there's a way that, you know, the NCAA president comes across like the hall monitor, like he's trying to take away our fun. But the truth is the sports books don't want these wagers anyway because it's a little bit hard to regulate. And, like, the one thing that sports books are very, very adamant about is they don't want to lose bets. They'd rather you not make a bet than bet, make a bet that they think you'll win. And obviously it's very hard for them to keep track of all these player props and the possibility for, I guess, you know, chicanery or whatever else. 
And so, therefore, when you see this, understand that the NCAA may ban it, but the sports books probably don't want to take these bets anyway. And that may be where all this is heading because about half the sports books have already done that. Now, speaking of wagering opportunities, Sweet 16 returns tonight. Four games on tap. Really only two have my interest peaked. I'm like a lot of you. I think UNC Alabama tonight can be a lot of fun. Probably not a ton of defense on either side, but probably a lot of fun. And if you look at the totality of what we're going to see in the regional semifinals tonight and tomorrow, I'd say this to me sort of feels like the best overall game. Perhaps you disagree. I feel like Alabama-UNC is probably the Sweet 16 round game that I'm the most interested in. I would also add to that UConn against San Diego State. You know, we said this earlier, that for all the talk about upsets and Cinderella's and things like that, that the later you go in the tournament, the tournament actually becomes a little bit more about the chalky seeds, the sure things. That's perhaps what you and uh, what, what UConn is, that they may just be a program playing at a level above anything else in college basketball. And tonight against uh, San Diego State could be a, a chance to do that. So I'm really watching tonight uh, four games watching for two things. How much better does UConn look than everybody else that's out there? And what kind of fun is the Alabama-North Carolina game? Alabama, one of just two SEC teams still remaining. North Carolina, one of the Blue Blood one seeds. This is probably pretty fun tonight between these two teams tonight. Of course, our Golden Shoe Bracket Challenge continues as well. So good luck to all of you as we keep track of those standings and eventually get ready to announce some winners there as it relates to that. So some really good stuff. We'll make that cruise around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. Let me also give a shout-out to our friends at the Finish Long Drink, because if you're getting ready to watch some basketball tonight, nothing goes better with that than a, a little Finish Long Drink, maybe sort of a late week, kind of pre-weekend with, uh, uh, a cocktail, but not just any cocktail. How about a ready-to-drink cocktail that comes in the can if you like mixed drinks, you'll love a mixed drink. You don't have to make uh, yourself. And that's what the Finnish long drink is. We think it's the best tasting beverage in this category, completely dominating from a flavor standpoint. And that's true whether you try the long drink cranberry, the long drink zero, no carbs, no sugar, the traditional, the blue can, the grapefruit flavor, flavor the gin kick. There's also the peach flavored version for a limited time here in the peach state. A lot of ways for you to enjoy the Finnish long drink here right now. So if you go to the website, thelongdrink.com, you can put in your uh, – address and find out where you can pick some up today and be a part of something that's been a big part of Dog Nation Daily for a long time here. That's the Finnish Long Drink. We love it. We believe you will too. Many of you already do. So enjoy some as you head towards the weekend. As we say goodbye to you today, let me give you a golden shoe. This one probably requires a little bit of explaining. Every now and then there are golden shoes we can't quite, we, we can't quite show on the show, you know, video, things like that. Yeah, we don't quite have the rights to be able to do that. Uh, B-Rad uh, G on uh, X put one of these out. Uh, kind of a f- fun mashup of the basketball win for Georgia against Ohio State paired with the Peach Bowl win uh, against the uh, Buckeyes a uh, couple of New Year's Eves ago. And obviously the fun that uh, uh, our buddy Scott Howard had with that call and some really good stuff. So uh, Brad made that. Stanley a lot wrote to him and said, Brad, you need to send this to Brandon Adams and Dog Nation Daily and get the golden shoe. This is absolutely awesome, my friend. Well, we can't quite show the video, but Brad did a good job putting it together. But I certainly appreciate Stanley spreading the good word about our program and the Golden Shoe. And we always love when y'all send fun submissions to us of people who are doing creative things online. And when we can show them, we will. Y'all have a great day. We'll give Golden Shoes out for that. And remind you, the Gator Hater Updater now stands at 1,237 days. That's how long it's been since Florida's beaten Georgia. We love that. We'll see all of you back here tomorrow, Dog Nation Daily. Presented by Merriweather and Tharp. And on video, time now for the R.S. Andrews Cooldown. R.S. Andrews, the one you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised, the price that's promised. You can trust them on all of that today. So I mentioned this to our video audience uh, prior to our show kicking off, which is I got some stuff to do kind of away from work today. So I am going to step away from the cool down here pretty early. But obviously we'll be back with uh, more cool down stuff tomorrow. So let me roll through the comments. We'll kind of do a couple of spins here, and then we'll get ready to bounce out after that. Uh, B Max still being very happy about that win for the Dogs against Ohio State in basketball. You love that. Getting ready for now. Seton Hall, that is the opponent in the NIT semis. A lot of people believe that Seton Hall should have been included in the tournament field, along with probably St. John's and Indiana State, who I believe is on the other side of the semifinals. You know, those uh, teams that were probably the most unfairly excluded. So Georgia playing a pretty good team here in this uh, NIT semifinal. 
Um, uh, BMAC says the latest game he'd been a part of was Georgia and the crowd in Atlanta against Oregon. That's an interesting thing. That was a raucous day that day. Georgia fans were so happy about I just I'll, I always have really fond memories of that game because we had a big event that day for Dog Nation, but also that was our first chance to see Georgia as the reigning national champs. Fun day. Fun day. Really good time. Uh, yeah, really good time. All right, let me go over to uh, Facebook here for a moment. See what's happening over there. And hopefully we're looking forward to some raucous environments here this year there as well for a lot of Georgia football games. And then, of course, the 2025 home schedule. Bigger and better than it's perhaps ever been before. Uh, and by the way, Ryan Walker reminding that he's got a uh, his godfather, Clarence K, coming up on his show. So y'all check out Ryan there for more on that. Gary Holt going into some work. Uh, Gary, hope you uh, have all that go well for you. William Camacho reminding it's been 1,237 days since Georgia lost a regular season game. How amazing is that? Uh, uh, a very, very interesting reminder there, William. Obviously coincide with that Florida game. David West getting ready for the Diamond Dogs up there at Tennessee, one of the most easily uh, disliked teams in the SEC, the detestable Tennessee Vols in baseball. So a uh, fun series for the Diamond Dogs coming out with that. Braves were supposed to play today. That got postponed till tomorrow because – of the weather, who would have ever imagined bad weather in Philadelphia in late March? Uh, it seems easily avoidable not to play opening day in Philadelphia, but Major League Baseball steps into its own stuff again. Uh, Gerald Harmon is John T. Porter. Yeah, that was the NBA player who had the little player uh, player prop uh, issues. That is that is indeed correct. Steve Self mentioned the Georgia softball team at 28-4, ranked number three right now. Very successful season for them. Exciting to see. Uh, Miriam Corbin enjoyed the positive news from Terrence Edwards from practice. Yeah, very, very nice. Terrence good enough. He promised us he would, and he came back and really delivered today on all of that. That was, uh, that was wonderful. Wonderful stuff from Terrence Edwards on that front. How about a dog nation on YouTube here for a little bit? Let's see what's going on over there. Of course, hope you're all getting ready for Good Friday tomorrow, Easter weekend, and uh, uh, good time to be with family and friends. Foster Moss says, do they ban the the like the hip drop tackle from college? No, as of yet, not. But you got to imagine that'll kind of matriculate its way down. And honestly, listen, I'm all about player safety. I do get that. If I'm a defensive player, what am I supposed to do? I can't hit him here. I can't hit him below the knees. Now I can't hit him around the waist either. Like, am I supposed to just ask their permission to go down? Like, like what am I going to do? Now, like I said before, it's not my body that's out there on the line, so I totally respect that. I do understand that the uh, these judgment calls, they're just not. Um, the problem that you have with football is, is that nobody loses money when officials mess up. You know, not one person – is going to stop watching football because, you know, the SEC championship, for instance, the Isaiah Bond non-catch that was not even reviewed, not certainly not properly reviewed. Um, they don't lose money when these mistakes happen, so therefore they don't care about the mistakes, and that is abundantly true at both the college level and the NFL level. They don't care because it's, you know, the bad call goes against you, that hurts you, but it doesn't hurt the sport overall, so therefore they just keep right on rolling. And – these officials that have a hard time with judgment calls are now going to be given more judgments to call. I, I just think that's rough. I think that's rough. Um, let's see what else. Oh, yeah, DMART 42 on the subject of the uh, Ellis Robinson interception. Yeah, it sounds like that was a fun play. Uh, Croaking123 says, how about your favorite underrated wide receiver? I'll give you a couple of those. Um, from, like, near Terrence's, Ed, near Terrence's era, I, I love Damian Gary. I thought Gary was a lot of fun. Um, Kirby Smart era. You know, you got Javon. Let me, let me see if I can give you a really good. 
I want to try to give a really good answer to this question. The problem is, is, you know, so many Georgia guys sort of get so much attention that, it, you know, to be underrated, underappreciated becomes, I would say, a difficult thing to do. You know, I would have to put A.D. Mitchell in that category there as well because people are going to forget that Mitchell even played at Georgia because he goes on to Texas and, you know, obviously will sort of be treated as something different in the NFL level. But, y'all, you know, A.D. gave you not just a big catch against Alabama to put you in the national championship game. He kind of came back and did the same thing for you against Ohio State there as well. you got to save a special place in your memory banks for what A.D. Mitchell did in a Georgia uniform. I think you do. And, and the reason why I bring his name up is because for me, any kind of like special affection as a fan that I would have for a player is always going to be related to big moments and big games. And clearly Mitchell was as big a game performer as you could possibly have. Senior OG says Fred Gibson too. Yeah, I loved Gibson. Now Gibson's one of my guys because um, the first time I really sort of appreciated Fred Gibson, I think many of you the same way, you know, hobnail boot game, Tennessee 2001, he had a nice game for Georgia that day. And, you know, he had the look of, and this is the time in which, like, Randy Moss is, like, the biggest deal in the world. And it's certainly overstating things to say that Fred Gibson was going to be Randy Moss. But sort of, you know, slightly taller receiver. Boy, uh, uh, Fred Gibson really got you excited back then. Really got you excited. Uh, Paul Moon mentioning Marlon Brown. The Marlon Brown game for me is LSU 2004. What Marlon did against uh, Gibson had a good game that day, too. But Marlon Brown against LSU in 2004, that was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Um, wait, no, that's Reggie Brown. That's Reggie Brown. I always get Marlon Brown and Reggie Brown confused. That was Reggie Brown against uh, LSU in 2004. Um, Spencer Clark on the subject of Houston, one of the number one seeds. He says, pretty good balance their athletic department. The other thing is, like, those now, I know Houston's in the Big 12 now, but those sort of like group of five level Texas schools, they have more access to money than you realize. It's like you got the, you know, the former Astros owner Drake McLean's family connected to Baylor. You got the Tillman for is it Furtada? Is that how you say his name? Tillman Furtada connected to Houston. You're like, you got a lot of big money boosters with all of those Texas programs, not just Texas, Texas AM, but the sort of next level below. They've all got money, a lot of money in that state. Um, Somebody said they'd never heard of Seton Hall, so there you go. Uh, Paul Moon mentions Justin Scott Wesley. Uh, UGA football fan 1979 mentions the Michael Johnson catch against Auburn in 2002. It's only one of the great moments of all time. One of the great moments of all time. All right, final comments we got to go for today. Back on Facebook for a moment. Uh, Octavius Oliver says, how about Bryce Hunter? Yeah, no doubt. No doubt, obviously. Uh, uh, very, very a good number of happy memories of Bryce Hunter in his Georgia career for sure. Um, Pete Williams says the one thing we're going to have in our favor is uh, Kalen DeBoer is not going to have the refs in his pocket like Nick Saban did. So Pete weighing in. Scott Moody says another player from the era we mentioned a moment ago, Greg Blue. Greg Blue English has been hard for me today. Greg Blue would uh, have a lot of trouble with today's defensive rules. I would say that's probably the case. Thomas Davis, too. Uh, I would say that's probably the case. Winford Steinspring, thank you for the kind words. I appreciate that. All right, back on dognation.com. We're going to have to get ready to go today. Dogfan66, happy to hear Bryce Hunter mention this conversation. Uh, K-Dog wondering about 40 sacks in 2024. Y'all know how I feel. We talked about front seven, defensive line in particular a little earlier. You want to get back to that 40-sack number? My guess is you got outside linebackers and defensive linemen being drafted where you want them to be drafted, and my guess is you're probably back in that national championship business again too. Frogger 2000 says, I pick on LSU. I'm not picking on LSU. I think LSU's pretty good. Uh, I mean, if anything, hey, I picked LSU to make the playoff a year ago, Frogger. Uh, if anything, I ought, have a, I ought to have a beef with them for making me look so bad a year ago. Uh, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm okay on LSU here right now. Um, I do think it's where they're playing USC and UCLA in the same season. That's kind of strange. And I think that they got a pretty pretty good little schedule. I think, I think they're uh, I think they got a chance here this year to maybe be better than they're currently giving credit for. Let me say it that way. All right, we got to go.
Good stuff. Uh, y'all have a good day tomorrow. We'll get you ready for the weekend. Good stuff. Jeff Sintel, UGA Recruiting, and who knows what else. A lot of fun and surprises on the way. So have a, a great day. Y'all check out R.S. Andrews online, rsandrews.com, for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised, the price is promised. You can trust them on all of that. So make sure you check them out today. Uh, get your air conditioning unit tuned back up. You've got people coming over for Easter. You don't want like a hot house where it's like stuffy. You don't want that. You want it nice and cool and comfortable. That's what Easter is supposed to be all about. So find them online, rsandrews.com. Have a uh, great day. Back tomorrow, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Tharp. We'll look forward to talking to you then.